So whenever we have the SN1 reaction, there's a second type of reaction known as the elimination reaction or E1 reaction that can compete with our SN1 reaction. In the same way, whenever we have an SN2 reaction, under certain conditions that we'll discuss in just a moment, a second type of elimination reaction known as the E2 or bimolecular elimination reaction can readily compete with our SN2 reaction. So let's begin by remembering what the SN2 reaction is. In the SN2 reaction, we have a nucleophile that takes its pair of electrons, attacks this carbon via a backside way, kicking off this lone pair of electrons along with the leaving group. So we form the following product via a one-step SN2 reaction. Now, what happens in the E2 reaction is slightly different. Instead of acting as a nucleophile, it acts as a base. So it takes this pair of electrons, it takes away this H ion, leaving this pair of electrons. At the same time, this pair of electrons attacks this carbon, kicking off this leaving group. So, in both cases, we have a one-step mechanism in which our leaving group gets kicked off, but when we use or follow the E2 pathway, we form an alkene. So let's begin by determining what the rate law of our E2 reaction is. Well, the rate law for both of these reactions is the same exact rate law. Rate is equal to the K constant for this reaction in the forward direction multiplied by the concentration of both the substrate and the nucleophile. So for both cases, increasing either of these compounds either of these molecules will increase the rate of our reaction, of our forward reaction. So, let's explore in which case which one of these reactions takes place. So let's compare nucleophilicity to basicity. Recall that strong nucleophiles are molecules that compete for the 2p orbital, for the empty 2p orbital. While the strong bases are molecules that compete for empty 1s orbitals. So they're related, but they're not the same thing. In other words, when our E2 reaction takes place, this, uh, this nucleophile acts as a base competing for the 1s orbital, the empty 1s orbital of the H atom. On the contrary, this nucleophile acts as a nucleophile in the SN2 reaction competing for our empty 2p orbital. So, in SN2 reactions, the stronger the nucleophile and the weaker it is as a base, the more likely the SN2 reaction will take place. And likewise, when we want the E2 reaction to take place, we have to use a weak nucleophile and a strong base. So, if this is a strong base and a weak nucleophile, our E2 reaction is likely to take place. On the other hand, if this is a weak base and a strong nucleophile, it will be more readily, it will be more able to compete for our 2p orbital than the 1s orbital, so our SN2 reaction will take place. So finally, let's discuss how the substrate structure or size, <clears throat> size affects our rate of the reaction, or which one of these reactions will take place when our substrate is different. So, Suppose we can completely eliminate the occurrence of SN1-E1 reactions by using an aprotic solvent, such as acetone. So suppose we're mixing this substrate in acetone and we're using a nucleophile. So let's suppose we have a tertiary substrate. So if this is a tertiary substrate and we want the SN2 reaction to take place, will it take place? Remember, in order for an SN2 reaction to take place, it has to approach via a backside approach, attack this carbon, kicking off this uh, leaving group. So these electrons have to get past all the electrons orbiting these atoms. And in this case, because this is very sterically hindered, we have large groups. These electrons will not be able to intervene the backside approach, and so the SN2 reaction will not take place. Once again, in order for the nucleophile to undergo the SN2 reaction, it must get to the 2p orbital of the carbon via a backside interaction, a backside approach. 
these large alkyl groups will not allow this. On the other hand, let's examine our E2 reaction. In the E2 reaction, this same nucleophile, instead of trying to approach this carbon, it can simply approach one of these H atoms. Since this molecule is symmetrical, it doesn't matter which H atom it takes. Let's suppose it takes this H atom. It takes this H atom, forming our NH bond, kicking off this lone pair of electrons, this lone pair of electrons then attacks this carbon, forming our double bond and kicking off our leaving group, and we form the following alkene. So the E2 reaction is favored when our substrate is very sterically hindered. For example, for tertiary substrates, the SN2 reaction will not take place, but the E2 reaction will take place. So, conclusion. When the groups surrounding this carbon are large, as in this example, in the tertiary example, SN2 reactions cannot take place and E2 do take place. More readily, in which the nucleophile instead acts as a base, taking an H ion away and forming the alkene. So, once again, E2 reaction readily takes place because this is very sterically hindered. You can't get to the carbon because of all the electrons moving around. A lot of electrostatic repulsion found on these carbons. And so th these electrons can get to it. And so instead they say, hey, well, there's this H atom on top. I could just take the H atom and instead go via the E2 pathway, forming our double bond, forming our alkene.